Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks for turning up. Um, I have to apologise. Um, Peter had to plan that he couldn't attend at quite short notice, so I'll try to cover some of the subjects he was going to talk about. It's cobbled together over, over the last couple of days. Um, and some of you may know more about some of these sites than I do. I know some of, some of your, your names crop up uh, periodically in report and report and notes have come sorted. That one will be brilliant, thank you. <laughs> so, um, obviously, I'm not Peter Daly, I was round at the time what the events I'm talking about. My early, earliest involvement in the Archaeology of Mercy site was this site, uh, with, the, with uh, Rob Philpott, who I vaguely remember from that time. Uh, this is way up tree windmill, and I'm the long haired lad with the uh, big green arrow pointing at his backside. Uh, I remember the <laughs> the uh, ice on that site. That was really my first involvement with motorcycle archaeology, and it was a big a, a gap of uh, several, several years before I came back. But we'll skip that bit. Um, sort of travelled back in time to 1977. Uh, lots of ways very similar to today, today but look quite, quite different. Politics was a, a different landscape. Uh, it was in black and white for a start, not colour. Um, uh, apartheid is still going in South Africa, it's a very different country now. Uh, <coughs> music and culture, very different as well. Uh, you have this, everything from the Brotherhood of Man saying you're kissing me through to the Sex Pistols, I remember the Grundy interview up at the top. Um, Eric's was starting off in Liverpool, the Seminole Club, which now features in the galleries in, this, in the building we're sat in today. Um, Coating the Olympics as well. Um, Paralympics were a much smaller event, <coughs> not something that, not the large scale event that we see today. Uh, technology, video record records were just coming into the home. Um, my kids can't comprehend the, the notion that um, if you miss something, miss something, it's gone. It, it's, it, you might have to wait months or years before it's repeated. Three TV channels. Concorde did its first commercial flights. Uh, telephones were things bolted to a wall that you didn't carry them around with you, and the garage somewhere in California was weird looking <coughs> called Apple making computers in wooden boxes. So a different times, different time, different landscape socially and culturally. And into that landscape comes Merseyside. Uh, it's actually written in 1974, it's established, it's cobbled together out of bits of Lancashire and Cheshire and uh, Wirral. And uh, but Archaeologically, so, so pretty much uh, an, an unknown landscape. Lots, lots of other areas of the country have a relatively long and rich archaeological heritage. I've picked one journal totally at random, uh, Wiltshire Archaeological and Natural History Journal. This goes back to 1854. We do have a longer archaeological heritage around here. We've got uh, journals like Transactions of the Lancashire and Cheshire Antiquarian Society. That begins in 1883. That's focused as much on his, history rather than archaeology. Archaeology does feature, but it's relatively speaking a blank landscape. And that's, that sort of perception carries on even, even into the 1990s. This is again this is something I use when we're talking about Roman archaeology up here, but it applies to a lot of other periods. And we've got Barry Cunliffe's map, which has got, whoops, stick there, uh, sort of. Hill, Hillfort zones, uh, villages and open settlements, but you'll notice this big blank space where we are. And it's that perception, certainly around the 1970s, of uh, this just uh, in prehistory discussed as an area of uh, woodland, bogs, and moors, and uh, nothing much going on. So, anyway, back to the sort of prehistory of the Merseyside Archaeological Society. Um, this is the old hut, Hale Wood, um, where, the, uh, where the Jackie Melandro uh, plant is now. And it was the site was put that was um, excavated from the plants and the construction of the plants. Um, and it was reported in the, uh, the Society's Journal from 1988 to 1989. Uh, this is the excavation plan. It's very old school excavation, lots of long, narrow trenches. Chasing wall lines, quite um, some, something that might be done in the 19, 1930s. Um, and this, this is one of the uh, shot, shots of the, of the walls that we turned up. This is the, the sill from the uh, 17th century extension to that um, brick, brick built building that we saw in the first slide. 
He finds, this form, again, form part of our collections, reporting on the society's journal, relatively small quantities, but um, this, is, this material is significant because it's some of the first excavated medieval and early post-medieval uh, material from around here. So we've got these, uh, this little wee, wee mug here, uh, I think that's part of the chafing, chafing dish, uh, tin glazed earthenware, and this, these nice glazed ridge, ridge tiles. Again, okay, one part of my collection. And if you want to read about those, um, they're in uh, some of the journals also at the back. Uh, finds included glassware. Um, and one of the things I like, uh, like about preparing talks like, like this is it makes me look at things I'm, I think I'm very familiar with, but look at them in a fresh light. And one thing I did notice was this glass vessel, which is described as a uh, urinal. When you turn it upside down, it actually looks more like one of these. This is a base of a uh, glass uh, uh, pedestal, pedestal, but glass pedestal beaker from New, New Willows that was at uh, the Hall of Nerves about 10 years ago. And they're very similar, so I'd, I'd like to go back and reassess some of the glass the glassware from this site just to see whether I'm, it's possible that isn't a isn't urinal, whether it's uh, one of these uh, pedestal beakers. I need to actually see, see the object to be clear about that. So we've got the old bus excavated in the 1960s, and then I'm going to skip forward to March 1976. Merseyside County Council has been around for a couple of years, and I'm not uh, too clear about the exact process that happened, but basically, basically there doesn't seem to have been any planning control on archaeology in Merseyside. I think that's possibly tied into that perception of it being you know, this industrial wasteland with, uh, with everything built, up, built over. Uh, planning commissions given, uh, given, and one of the neighbours of the site uh, seems to have reported it to Peter Davy and some of, the, some of the people in this room involved in this excavation. And it sounds like an absolute nightmare. Um, you've got uh, uh, guys uh, swimming around in the mud, mud here trying to make sense of something that's already been bulldozed. Um, I get, I get booted off a construction site if I was doing that these days. It looks great fun. Uh, this just gives you a picture of it, this sort of landscape. And it's amazing that anything at all was retrieved from this. Yeah, but really, this is, I suppose, the, the beginnings of the Merseyside Ar Archaeological Society is the realisation that these significant moated sites were being developed with no attention being paid to them. Uh, what, they, what they did manage to get was sections across the uh, moat. Uh, here it's been cleaned, it's actually some stone and vetting have been cleaned up. A nice deep trench. I don't know if anybody recognises themselves in there. Uh, this is a picture of the revetting again. Uh, and some nice uh, machine excavated sections. You know, modern standards, perhaps not, perhaps not what we do, we do now, but. Given the resources available at the time, at least someone was there doing something and recording this stuff, which is really important. And this is from Margaret Warhurst's plan, the excavation. So they've picked up the line of the moat here. We've got some sections excavated across it. There. And internal features were few and far between. Uh, as the report mentions this stone lined drain, that seems to have been one of the few things picked up. Um, <coughs> there's talk about um, this layer of, uh, of soil which had all the uh, bulldozer tracks in it, lots of modern debris. When you see the original, this is bits of chicken wire and things poking out there. Well, this is quite clearly bulb clay, bulb clay geology underneath, but relatively undisturbed. And we might come back to that later. Uh, find report. Um, unfortunately, there isn't one uh, with the excavation report. I can't find any finds in our archives. Um, that's what I've got so far. Um, they do mention um, what's, what's described as 19th century pottery from the fill of the moat, which presumably was filled in. But um, under the circumstances, I say it's amazing that anything was retrieved from that site. And um, that's recognised at the time, this is a quite direct quote from uh, Margaret, Margaret Warhurst's reports. Um, we have not such a wealth of archaeological sites in Merseyside that we can afford to let those remaining slip quite right into the hands of the developers without investigating them first. So the Merseyside Archaeological Society is there right at the beginning 
of recognising that these sites are being destroyed, it's important that they're rescued and something needs to be done about it. So we skip forward to later in 19, 1926 and the development of this building, which um, I, I don't, I've not seen the inside of it, but um, it's, uh, the, out, the outside of it is uh, recognisable to anybody as the, the law, law courts by Derby Square. And this was the scene of the first significant archaeological excavation in, in central Liverpool, which was largely organised by MAS, headed by Peter Davy and Rabina McNeil. Um, these are some shots of the site. Um, this, uh, this must be very, very early days. Um, Trapped excavator with teeth on it used to lift, lift up the tar tarmac. Um, again, this, is a, this bottom right one is the, is the uh, site, site being, being impressed as being stripped. Um, that's what it looked like um, be be before the, uh, the archaeologists arrived on the site. We've still got these Victorian shops and warehouses there. And that's the site today. We've got our law courts there. I've tried to get up from Google Maps as close as, close as I can to the same viewpoint from there. I don't know, does anybody know where that photo, I've seen that's from the City Engineers collection, it looks like it's taken from a low-flying low aircraft or a helicopter or something like that. Uh, this is going to be the wonders of digital technology. So the excavated area, they're, they're faced again with the situation of the building given planning permission, no real provision for archaeology, what do you do with it? Um, which area, you know, limited resources, I think the grant was something like a thousand pounds from the DOE, um, which even back then wasn't a fantastic amount of money, it's not going to buy you an awful lot in terms of resources. So they decided to look at the area to the south of the castle, this is the, the Gomes 1644 plan for Liverpool. Um, the castle site um, they decided to um, largely avoid because it was just outside the main area affected, and also that part of the, uh, the, the hill that the castle was situated on was a bit its top sliced off, so it didn't have a great deal of potential. So he decided to have a go at two relatively small areas. I can't remember the exact size, but we're talking 15 by 15 metres, something like that. The 1977 trench down here, uh, excavated by Ravina, um, was slightly larger. And this is our first trench, and you can see inside here the, the multiple road surfaces that were taken off with that with the bulldozer, with the tram lines there that all had to be cut, cut through. Um, looks like that was done by uh, the, the archaeologists, it must have almost been a welder or something. Um, we've got these cut features in, in there. The ones I'm going to, just going to concentrate, well, describe briefly are the ditch down here which was possibly part of the Civil War defences on that Pagoma plant. Uh, this thing here, which is the cellar identified as the fish market, and uh, this circular feature here, which is identified as this. Um, it's a, a lock-up, similar to the one on the, up in Everton. Uh, it's only there for a very short period of time. It was uh, constructed 1720, demolished 1722, something like that. It's a relatively short-lived structure but um, it seems to have been timber with a, a central timber post in it. And the fish, mar fish market is identified off this plan in Greg Gregson, 18 1820. Um, it's described in the, the sorted documents at the time as a um, 18th century equivalent of a fish and chip shop. Uh, there's a section, a section across it, and you can see it's crammed full of rubble, but mixed in with all that was, lo was lots of um, late 17th, early 18th century ceramics. And this is, that's, that material is some of the first to be, to be um, recovered from central Liverpool. Uh, this is a shot of Rabina's Trench, that's, that's the one at the southern end. You can see the law courts going up behind them. Uh, that's the Victoria Monument there. And that's the section after all the um, 19th, 18th and 19th century cellars have been stripped out. And what you can see here, these tip lines, those, that's late 17th, early 18th century tipping into the pool. Um, for anyone not familiar with it, the pool is where Liverpool takes part of its name from. Uh, it shows the sea lake on this uh, slightly imaginative uh, 19th century reconstruction of central Liverpool. But we've got, we've got the castle here, 
and the pull there, and the venous trench has been roughly there in, in this drawing. So just quickly, quickly look at some of the finds. These were what we recovered from those, those deposits. We've got tobacco pipes. This is, again, the society was responsible for recovering some of the first large assemblages of those from central Liverpool. The first examples of sugar mould. Uh, sugar, a very important industry in central Liverpool in the 18th, 18th, 17th and 18th century. Um, uh, near complete vessels, this posset cup, uh, tin, tin glaze, delf. And so that's the beginnings of archaeology, really the beginnings of archaeology in, cent in central Liverpool and all its fringes. And again, that's part of um, the society's legacy. We're going to spring forward to the present day now, a very different landscape. Uh, politics has changed and it keeps changing. I, I slide, that slide's already out of date, so we think we've gone. Um, so South Africa's changed that world recognition, but the, the Middle East is now uh, got its own problem. Uh, music, um, I recognise some of these bands. Uh, my kids have told me who that lot are, I can't remember, it hasn't sunk in. Uh, but the Rolling Stones are still touring Cuba. You know. Just, just about. Um, bars and bars in Central Loop. Eric's is long gone, but there are new bars like the Camp and Furnace. The Olympics are still with us, but again, I mentioned the Parallel Olympics, that's much, much bigger and that's part of change in society. Technology is unrecognisable. Big, massive flat screen televisions, multiple TV channels, um, you know, and, but transport. Concorde wasn't the future, it was a dead end. It stayed in its buckets, cheap, cheap airlines. Um, I've been spending a lot of time on Ryanair recently for personal reasons. But, um, and that company that started in a, in a garage in uh, California manufacturing computers in wooden boxes and is churning out this multi billion pound company churning out these things. So, di different, different planet in lots of ways. And the archaeology reflects that as well. We've moved, moved so I've concentrated on just a, a couple of selected sites that cover roughly the same chronological period as we looked at with, with the old huts. Uh, we've got the green here, um, a similar sort of mo mo motive site. We have the luxury here though of the, the time to do it, the resources to strip a large area and investigate it in detail. That's part of that legacy of sites like the tree farms. And we've got foundations of buildings, we've got time to excavate it professionally. Uh, and, and do a really thorough job on it. And that's reflected in the, the quantity of finds that we've got. We've got complete, complete vessels, uh, complete glass bottles, uh, fragments of 17th century drinking vessel, uh, complete ceramics, which effectively this is the contents of a, a, an early 18th century kitchen cupboard, uh, six, late 16th century shoe leather from pits. And that society has retained an involvement in that through publication it's published in the Society's Journal. Newton Hall, another uh, post-medieval post hall, again, an area of excavation, uh, investigated in detail. Um, but it does compare closely with the old, old hut. This is the foundations of Newton Hall here. You see it's very similar to the old hut. Finds again, lots of, not quite the quantities of uh, ceramics I would expect, it's a little Victorian truncation. Uh, but we've got uh, tigs, uh, these penicillin beakers, the glass penicillin beakers again. And in central Liverpool, we've got large open area excavation. I just picked this one because it's one I worked on. Uh, there were others that uh, Oxford Archaeology North did over on Strats Park. We've got much better understanding, certainly, of the um, early post, post medieval and industrial archaeology in the area than we did in the 1970s. Uh, that is, instead of you are sat roughly over where the lock gates are there. And finds from that have been totally instructive, huge quantities of ceramics. Um, and that started to build up in, into a picture uh, with um, trade, 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 trade patterns across the world. This is a Jeff Speakman slide from his latest holiday in the States. It's a museum uh, in Kings, Massachusetts. Uh, and these are finds excavated from an 18th century tavern, and those plates here are instantly recognisable as the same sort of material here. So we've built on those solid foundations in the 1970s to um, 
get a much better idea of, of trade, trade patterns. So hopefully my generation of archaeologists will be building on, on, the, on the stuff that was done in the 1970s. So anyway, you might have seen my Facebook post about trouble. I was trying to wheedle this in as a title to the title and failed totally. I was sort of, well, but it, it came to me in the last hour yes, yesterday about how I've worked this in. If we go back to U Tree House, and um, look at the, some of the uh, slides, slides in there. These are the foundation trenches for the house that um, stands on the houses that stand on the site now. Uh, it's much clearer on the original, but you can see the boulder clay here, and that's that top layer of heavily churned up stuff full of chicken wire. But underneath it, there are other layers, horizontal layers, bed, bedded. Now it's really difficult to make sense of it. But I wonder if there's not spaces in these gaps between the houses where the, the archaeology isn't quite as badly destroyed as, as it appeared at first sight. Maybe it's worth going back to. When we look at the, this again, this is crypt from Google Earth, we've got these green spaces here. And perhaps it's worth going, re revisiting, re revisiting this site. Maybe knocking, knocking on a couple of, couple of doors trying to get people interested and return, returning to it in the future. Um, it may, may be the total wild goose chase, but I've excavated in people's back gardens before. Uh, this is in the garden, this is Irby, um, where we had something like 49 trenches in the garden, gardens of the housing estate constructed in the 1930s. And it turned out the archaeology that actually survived relatively well. I wouldn't expect anything quite this good uh, at, at, at U Tree Farm, because uh, tracks off the, bull, off the bulldozer. But it may be that we get pits cut into natural with, with, with medieval or post-medieval pottery. Uh, and, and we won't know unless we look. So when I get time one day, um, I'll like, pop, around, pop around one day, try tapping on a couple of doors and see, and see where that takes us to maybe build that into the, to the community archaeology project. The other one, back to the future, is the old hut. In Hale Wood. For years, I assumed that that site was underneath the production line that well, Forbes and then Jaguar Land Rover, and just totally broke it off. It was only when I was preparing this, I thought, I don't actually know where it was. Let's have a look at the map sequence for it. So I did. I dug up, well, uh, uh, geo-reference to modern survey, the old first edition modern survey on the current mapping, and it turns out that the old hut is actually there, which is now a car park. And a nice green space. Now there's a lot of checking to do on this. I need I need to go do, do a much much more thorough job job on there. But there's a potential there. But um, we've got there some, still got bits of old huts that are surviving. In particular, the moat. The moat wasn't it doesn't seem to have been excavated in the 1960s. I can't find anything in the excavation report. But it's clearly there in the first edition OS. And if you compare it with the Utrecht farm, it's going to be quite a substantial feature. So it's unlikely that it would have been destroyed by the construction of the car park. So again, that's the letter to um, to Tata who own Jaguar Land Rover at the moment. So if I just spend a couple of thousand and get some nice publicity, <coughs> we'll, we'll try it again. If you don't, if you don't look, you never, you never find out. But anyway, hopefully that story is to be continued. Thanks very much.